um, what the practice of security or the research in security that they do in their companies um, are, and then uh, have each of them speak uh, in, in turn. Uh, Jim's got a slide, slide's not necessary. And then I want to ask about their views on uh, a science of security. And, and this is really meant to be interactive, otherwise it would be like a really short uh, panel. So yeah. the idea is that you know, you've, you've got folks from industry here, and so pepper them with questions, and uh, we'll have a grand old time. So the first thing I'm going to do is ask each of them to introduce themselves briefly, and then, um, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mark Scott. I work with a company called Forcepoint. Uh, Forcepoint, probably no one's really heard of it. Uh, it's actually a new, a new brand, a new company. Um, uh, I, I work for Raytheon, Raytheon Cyber uh, Products. Uh, Raytheon actually did a joint venture with, uh, Web, uh, with WebSense and it, uh, acquired a company called WebSense that did email filtering, spam filtering, a lot of uh, products like that. And then um, we also acquired uh, Stonesoft uh, Firewall and then some McAfee's uh, Firewall products as well. Uh, so that's all been spawned off into a company now, and then, um, so now we're Force Point. And so uh, I work on the federal side, and we have obviously the commercial side and the federal side. So coming out of Raytheon, uh, our customers have always been you know, DOD, intelligence community, Five Eyes, countries, uh, different governments, and things like that. So. Uh, we have um, in, within within Forcepoint, even just on the federal side, we have a pretty wide range of security products. Uh, we have some uh, products that do deal specifically with the insider threat, advanced persistent threat, and a lot of uh, behavioral analytics around all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's not a product that I work on. I work in the, what we call the cross-domain solutions environment. Uh, that uh, specifically has to do with all of the unique uh, needs and requirements that uh, government customers have that deal with multiple security levels like secret, top secret, things like that. So uh, as far as transferring data up and down, uh, trying to have access to multiple levels of secure, uh, secure information uh, simultaneously, uh, there's just a whole suite of issues that come up about dealing with all of that. So the product that I work on is a, is a, a thin client that gives you a single pane of glass to be able to uh, get uh, virtual desktops on multiple multiple uh, uh, secure levels. So that's uh, that's the product I work on here locally. I'm actually here local uh, here in Champaign. We have a small research uh, facility here that works on that. So that's the world that I deal in. Uh, so I'm not sure what else. To, I guess that's so probably, my, that's so probably, Warren, why don't you pass it on to, to, sure. to Jim? So I'm uh, Jim Lenz. I'm as well live here in Champaign. And but my background, I've had four careers. And I illustrate a little bit up here is uh, in the 80s, I worked with aerospace, with Boeing and, and Honeywell on fighter jets and commercial airplanes. And, and I always uh, had a career when electronic controls were first being brought into machines. In the 90s, I did a lot of work with uh, Toyota and Honda and BMW and Volkswagen and so on. Again, when microprocessors first came in, you know, today, automobiles have over 100 microprocessors on them. It's interesting, the architecture, airplanes, of course, use an architecture that's much more like cabinet architecture. You have boxes, black boxes, mounted in the airplane to do various types of controls. And so then it becomes relatively easy to keep the security related to those systems. Automotive went to an architecture I call a snap-together architecture, where every controller, every function is its own controller. So even in your door, you might have four controllers. One that does door locks, one that does raises the window up and down, one that opens the door. So they're all isolated controllers that are on a bus that networked around the, the, the system. Then in the 2000s, I joined John Deere. It was looking for someone to become an organizer for Congress Worldwide. They were just bringing microprocessors onto their controls. And I had a job to run the, their, their systems for 14 years worldwide, bringing a stability and approach to security as well as commonality in uh, their electronic systems. So I put this chart together, this is a little bit of an illustration of uh, what the differences are. And you know, what the world wants, if you're on a machine, is you want to tie yourself to the IT world. Because the IT world, just with Moore's Law, drives cost and drives capability and drives supplier, supply base is just massive. And if you don't tie yourself to that, then your cost of electronics is much higher. Because you have to do it. <coughs> 
So we'll be, all these systems, whether it's the 80s or the 90s or 2000s, we're always looking how can we tie ourselves to the IT world. What, and I think our friend here from Rock will talk about as well, in the 1980s there was really a splintering. Aerospace <coughs> split off from the IT world and developed its own platforms related to safety and security. The main drivers of this, this rule is called DO-178. It's, it's a requirement about how you can make your, safe, your system safe and processes associated with that. In the 1990s, when OBD came in, it really caused a splintering away from the IT world and developed its own platforms in the automotive world and because of diagnostics and commonality of diagnostics across the entire industry. And then the, the same thing's happening now with off-road. And I can show you a little bit of architecture around the off-road and come back to that at some point. But it just shows a little bit of this, this, this thing. So what I hear in this conference is so much about the I, what I call the IT world. But there's a huge opening right now of how do we bring security into these other platforms. Because the other platforms are going to exist, and I'll show you why in the next slide. If you want to get into a deeper discussion about mobile machines. But uh, how do those concepts come into this, uh, this other types of layering, other types of needs and systems? So that's my background, a little bit of introduction of maybe something to talk about today. OK, good, thanks. So my name is David Dreeb, and I uh, work for Rockwell Collins in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, Rockwell Collins provides avionics and communication solutions for uh, civil aviation, so airplanes, and military systems. Um, I work in the Advanced Technology Center, and in particular in the Cyber Systems Group. Uh, my interest is in employing formal techniques to address security objectives. Uh, so for, for 20, 25 years, uh, we've been trying to figure out ways to use formal methods uh, to address issues uh, in, in, in the spaces that we're interested in. Uh, we began uh, sort of pounding away at uh, the do 178 b requirements uh, a long time ago and trying to figure out, is there any way that we can apply formal techniques to reduce the cost of conformance to these sorts of requirements? And uh, we struggled for a long time. Uh, recently, uh, there have been some developments uh, that we were involved with uh, that, that are there's a formal methods annex now, the DO 333 uh, annex for uh, the DO 178B process that allows you to incorporate formal methods uh, into your development process in various ways. Uh, it's not a revolution, uh, it's sort of an evolution, and it's taken. 25 years, really, uh, to, to make even that much progress. It's a very uh, conservative uh, sort of industry that we're in. It doesn't move very quickly. Uh, and so uh, it takes a long time for things to change. Um, so as we're, trying to, as we're trying to figure out how we can use formal methods to meet these sort of certification requirements, at some point we were exposed uh, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, to the common criteria. And it turns out that the common criteria has uh, requirements for security certification. And their higher EAL levels, EAL 5, 6, and 7, actually called out formal methods as a requirement for that certification process. And so we kind of jumped on that bandwagon. Uh, we had been developing a uh, microprocessor for, for many years, even more than 20 years, uh, that we use in a lot of our products called the AMP. And we had recently developed a version of the AMP that had built into it a separation kernel. Uh, we didn't call it that at the time. Its, its original intent was to satisfy the requirements for integrated modular avionics, where the idea is that you take highly critical applications and low critical applications, and you put them together on the same processor and run them side by side. And of course, in the safety world, you're worried that you know, this, the lower uh, assurance application might interfere in some way with the higher assurance application. We didn't want that. So we developed the system to support that need uh, in the safety world. Well, it turned out that this is the same sort of thing that people were interested in the security world. Uh, so now we can call that a separation kernel. We want to keep maybe different levels of information, so different security classifications and different partitions separate. So we pursued this on this AMP7 and uh, in uh, 2007, we received a certification for the AMP7 uh, from the NSA that said that the AMP7 was certified to process unclassified through top secret code word 
information simultaneously. So it can coexist on the same device. Uh, this was this was done through a formal analysis of the microcode of the AMP7, and uh, and it achieved effectively an EAL7 certification under common criteria. It's not precise; it was an NSA certification, but that was, it was, it was the equivalent. So this product has since been used for multi-level type one cryptographic solutions. Uh, it's been used in a, in a secure cross-domain guard, and it's also found its way in the commercial sector as a, um, as a secure data diode on the, uh, it's the Airbus A350. So it, it, communicate, it, it acts as a data diode to allow information to flow from one security domain in the aircraft to another. Uh, more recently, uh, we've, we've done work with on um, the DARPA Hackums program, uh, where we're doing, dealing with high assurance cyber physical systems. And in that case, we're leveraging the SEL4 separation kernel, uh, which is a formally verified uh, separation kernel that came out of Uja NITCA. And we're uh, combining that with architectural level modeling, where we're using compositional reasoning techniques to construct systems that are. Uh, you know, ideally uh, immune uh, to, to cyber attack or, or a strong defense against such, such attacks. Uh, and so uh, one of the outcomes of this is the so-called hack-proof drone that we've seen in the news. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little overstatement there, but nonetheless. So that's some of my background and some of my interests. Um, just uh, a quick kind of overview of the sorts of environments that we deal with. Uh, we're typically, I mean, there's, there's a broad spectrum of things, but typically we're interested in embedded environments. Uh, they're often real time. Uh, they're typically safety critical. Uh, we live in a regulated environment, uh, so there's government regulations and certification requirements that we often have to meet. Uh, so it's a very conservative and slow moving environment. Uh, we have long product life cycles. Uh, 20 years or more is not uncommon, and it's, as, as I said, very slow moving. We're very interested in swap requirements of size, weight, and power, sometimes size, weight, power, and cost. Um, and we're resource constrained, typically, so we don't have a lot of memory, we don't have a lot of processing power, or a lot of network bandwidth. So that's sort of the world, so when I'm talking about security issues, is, this, is, this is the domain that I am coming from, and so uh, the, my opinions generally will reflect these sorts of concerns. Bill, did you have a question? You're Actually, I do have a question. Uh, I mean, I probably have many of mine is general thought. I'll just ask, I wanted to ask you one. So I know of the great work that Rockwell Collins has been doing, and uh, in the academic community, as we saw from David's talk, I was trying to be loud. Uh, but in the academic community, as we saw in David's talk, there's an interest in these probabilistic um, measures, not just um, deterministic measures. I don't know why I say absolutely for uh, other reasons that may not be accepted. But um, is that something that the community that you work in is ready to consider? Or does everything have to be all or nothing, or they don't value it? So that's a good question, and we've struggled with that uh, as well. Uh, we, we like the black and white, uh, right? So we like to be completely right uh, and not wrong at all, if we can. Um, but we also realize that uh, we can't quantify everything. And some things you know, sort of intrinsically have some notion of, of risk or probabilistic uh, you know, attributes to them. Um, in the in the sort of security uh, certification world, there's there's like the uh, the RDAC sort of thing. So there's, there's this risk process for assessment, and I think in that context, it makes a lot of sense to talk about uh, probabilistic sorts of things. Um, it, in some ways, it's more difficult in the secure in the safety world. Um, again, uh, very black and white there, and they like things to be right or wrong, or they want some reason for it. Right and wrong, even if the answer about right and wrong is wrong. I, 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 I don't mark <laughs> that. Um, so we've looked at, we looked at uh, probabilistic model checking. Uh, we've, we've contemplated how that might be applied. Do you think it's most applicable in the security domain or most transferable in that domain? 
So I've got another question for anybody on the panel that, that wants to take it. And so that's based on um, you know, the work that you do. What gaps do you see um, in advancing security that a rigorous science of security, such as we are trying to develop in this program, uh, might help? So I think the interest here would, would be the challenges. What are the gaps? You know, it, it might be, you know, what sh well, if it was up to you, what should we be working on would be maybe an interpretation. Well, I've got a few notes. <laughs> um, uh, so in, 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 in the, the areas that I deal with, um, you know, we're looking at uh, general desktop computing environments and, and uh, traditional guards, guards and things like that. Um, you know, we're certainly looking for more uh, research in the areas of, of uh, analytics or threat detection and things like that, Even different behavioral modeling things, things uh, the things that have been talked about. So those are, those are all the things I think that, that we're certainly interested in as well. Um, I think there's also continued op opportunities for you know, biometrics and things like that. A lot of our customers are looking at new and innovative ways to authenticate, things like that, uh, as, well, as well as like derived, derived credentials, um, d different ways to apply those in, in, a, in a practical sense. Um, uh, one thing, uh, we also you know, deal with a lot of crypto, and there's also talk about um, you know, quantum crypto and post-quantum crypto, quantum-resistant quantum crypto. Those are all things I think that are being worked on now, but I'm, I'm sure there's uh, additional work to be done there. So, uh, and then we, we also have uh, you know, uh, customers looking at mobile environments and things like that. So there's always uh, ways uh, we want to look for mobile wireless, things like that. But, Ways to lock down uh, some of the stuff that you talked about, you know, as far as uh, locking down VMs. I think all of those types of uh, research would be would be great to, to be able to get more insight into how to really lock down uh, desktop environments uh, at the hypervisor level. Or, you know, type one that you uh, ways to ways to improve that. And then one of the one of the things that's always, uh, of course, nowadays it's always in the news is. Uh, uh, vulnerabilities in media, media codecs, media playback, the multimedia uh, is always an issue um, just by nature of uh, trying to interpret data coming in across the wire. Uh, there seems to be always problems with uh, dealing with that. So those are those are uh, a constant, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, DOD applications, military applications, as they continue to use more and more video and things like that, uh, those, those kind of things become more critical to the mission. And uh, so be able to securely uh, transfer that data, display that data, you know, play back that, that information, and be able to uh, inspect the inspect the codecs and make sure that they are, are uh, there's no malware in the in the in the codec itself or in the, in the media itself. That's always uh, something we're trying to keep on top of. Um, and then just general you know malware malware crypto ransomware type stuff that's uh, going on. Another thing that uh, that I also would like uh, more more understanding of some, some additional static static code analysis type things that we would always be interested in as far as being able to harden our code that we write and uh, to be able to make sure that <coughs> we're doing secure you know best practices uh, security related things like that. So those are the those are kind of the areas that uh, I just kind of came up with that uh, to me seems like a lot of areas that could a lot of good research can be done, and I know a lot of it has already been done. But uh, those are the kinds of areas that kind of I think are the uh, most interest to the customers that I've been with. Yeah. So my other slide. Before you leave that slide, I'm curious about the, how you assess the vertical axis of that. It's just the Moore's law, you know. It's just the, and so it's the connectivity to uh, the IT world. So how how over the time when did things branch off from the IT world? It's just trying to illustrate that. Trying to illustrate Moore's law. Why the kink in the off road? Well, this is what I want to talk about. Huh? Why is there a kink in the off-road? Why are we struggling in the off-road industry, which is the latest adopter of, of onboard controls? 
but the bottom line is there's this connectivity to the cloud and you've heard of precision agriculture and the need from satellite data and there's now 20 satellite systems taking pictures every day of crops this data is being, can be assembled and used to give direction to machines on what to do the next day so there's a huge connectivity to the outside world that off-road machines have more so than on-road machines So that, that to me is, is uh, what John, you're hired to be to do is to come in and help them. Should they be an IT company or should they become an automotive? Work with automotive suppliers work with IT suppliers. You really need to work with both. So taking from Roger's thought, I'm going to show you a little bit about like, an architecture inside of a model or a tractor or a, a semi truck or any mobile device more or less has the same layers of things. So you saw it earlier for, for industrial plant, very similar for an onboard or a mobile machine. So at the low, lowest level is this power train. So the key thing there is you need non-preemptive algorithms. I mean this the algorithms need they run and they run on this on a, on a millisecond time scale. So and they're dealing with just bytes of information. Slide didn't work out. But anyway the key is this happens in the millisecond time frame. We use a small packet of information. The important point is that as we as Volkswagen taught us, is that every millisecond that controller makes a decision how to run that engine. And so you have choices, as no as they've shown, as you have choices of what you do with that engine. What you want to have better fuel economy or have better emissions. And that every company that makes engines does does the all the time. And they're all running inside the machine, especially now with these exhaust emission controls. It's even more complicated. How do you really choose how to run your engine? I have to jump in. This is very interesting to me. Um, all of these algorithms, they're not each running on their own microprocessor, right? So on the on the on the microprocessors in which more than one algorithm runs, is there Things uh, such as separation in the OS, address specification, timing specification, to ensure uh, that the that the code does not interfere with things at other levels. So this is exactly the issue of the second level, where you start by call bundle control. They're bundled features. So yeah. in the case of John Deere, our 16-bit microprocessor control boxes will run anywhere from 10 to 15 features. Be rough. Like one feature is turn on the lights. You have a button sitting there. So for the 30 year life of that tractor, as long as it's on, there's a, a controller sitting waiting for somebody to push that button. And then the controller will go out and take the action to actually turn those lights on. But all those algorithm time, all those buttons sit there on those controls, but they're, but they're really in reserve. So this is the challenge we have with uh, this interlock control, is how do you prioritize? And we've had lots of babbling idiots, we call them on the bus, where they think they are the most important thing. And the next thing that's the most important thing. So there's a lot of issues about this, this architecture. So many companies have written all their own code for this level in there. When you get down to the powertrain, this is non-preemptive. I mean, it is running one element over and over and over. Because it's, it's, it needs to run the engine every millisecond. So it's can't be interrupted. So that that and so that is another type of, of software platform that you write into that uh, you again most people design it themselves and that typically runs on one microprocessor. An engine controller is one microprocessor that has you know, 40 to 50 different sensor inputs and every millisecond is making decisions about what fuel to inject, what how to run the exhaust system, what temperatures to run things at, preheat the fuel, and so on. Many different aspects of running. What you, your question is about is as we go up now, we bundle features. So there's so many, there's 100 features on a tractor, but in any day you want to use one or two of them. But they all have to sit there to be used. What automotive does is because they want to manufacture the machines so quickly, like on a door, all the features are self contained in the door. So all the microprocessors, each feature has its own microprocessor. And so the software associated with it is embedded into that microprocessor. 
So their microprocessor controllers are you know, the size of power. So there you don't have this issue of multitasking or deciding which controller. To use. In our on road, we don't want 100. We, we have a chance to integrate. So we've gone to what I call this bundled controller, bundled feature target detection that's gone on. And, and automotive, it looks like it's going more and more. As automotive goes more advanced with these adaptive driving assistance systems, automatic braking, automatic parking, they're getting more where they're going to bundle these features into multiple. So they're going to have this challenge of how do you, you know, which one should be turning the car at this time, and how do you interact with it, and how do you make sure things are secure. You know. uh, good question. So if your execution is, is every millisecond, what's your I.O. bus speed? Yeah, so this is the other challenge. Because this is what I try to show is we're developing what we call a deterministic bus at this low level. And we can't afford real, you know, Air 8659 type buses. So we have built systems where we isolate the CAN bus so that there's not many, anybody else on it except exactly who we know about. So messages then don't have any delays. And messages you can get through. And now you can, if, you, if you're looking for security, you can synchronize two sensor inputs to make sure that they're the same value. So you time stamp all of the information. But yes, as we go to the CAN bus, I mean, you cannot uh, time stamp things and you can look at things. So then it becomes much more complicated about how you uh, run in real time. <coughs> but this is one of our needs, is this deterministic busing networks so that you can really run controls properly and not get interfered with. But we typically do that by closing that system, isolating it. So you also need synchronized. Yeah. For blocking, so you have a physical blocking synchronization? Yeah, there's a heartbeat. heartbeat. You know what? When I worked on the Airbus system, it, it was sort of a tenth of a second. At John Deere, our heart beats one second. So in those controllers, every second is all the algorithms have to, you have to run in that time frame. Then the messages can come in and you run again. So all your algorithms have this, this heartbeat that you have to live with. So the, the processor is pulling in features and algorithms to fit inside that heartbeat. So that's why we write our own OS. The operating system has to manage all of this to make sure that we fit within this heartbeat so that all the messages are then synchronized on the bus. Could you comment on the OS and to what extent it has memory protection between tasks and all the kinds of This is our biggest expect? trouble is somebody will write a program and you know, they'll overrun memory. And we, we don't know how to check this. We, we don't find it until sometimes six months, two years later. When somebody's writing this feature, this feature, this feature, and all of a sudden now this feature is stepping on the memory of this other one. We don't have a way of checking. There's no hardware that, that prohibits that. There's no, no. No, no, no algorithm in your kernel that prohibits that. No. Now AutoZar is coming out. Maybe you've heard of AutoZar. It's a global of Bosch, and the whole automotive world's got together and said, we're going to build one platform to work on. And they're partitioning things more so that you can't step on each other from memory memory leaking and memory falling over. But this is, most of our problems is memory. So people will forget to clear their memory or clear their registers in their own programs. So you run it 10 times that day. You run it two times a day, and then you reset it. When we restart the engine, it goes away. You run it 10 times that day, all of a sudden it's stepping on somebody else's phone. What kind of programming languages do you use? C. And we've done C. I think automotive as well. And, and, and C. But we're going much more now to simulate like automotive almost exclusively as a you see do auto code generation. So auto code generation can generate about 80% of your code. You know, 20% still has to be hand coded because you're talking actuators, you're talking certain types of drivers, certain types of interlock things that are more difficult to put into your uh, model. So there's still a lot of hand coding stuff to, to make this work. So is that a common thing that you're using similar also? Yes. Yeah, it's becoming more common. Uh, Traditionally, um, a lot of the stuff was like Ada, uh, for instance. Uh, more, more modern systems, you, have, you do have a lot of C and you have a lot of C. So the next interesting thing that's happening in, in agriculture is this third level that I call the uh, automation loop. So now since tractors are all X by wire, or machines are all X by wire, or excavators are all X by wire, 
So now people have found out, well, I can have other systems control. Why should you steer the tractor? I can have other authorities steer the tractor or stop the tractor, like the baler. You know, you know what a baler is? It makes a bale of hay. Well, the, bale, the baler knows exactly when the bale is done and what I should do about that bale to release it or to move it or do the quality of it or change the speed of the tractor if it's not being compacted right. So there's a lot of ideas the implement manufacturers have that I really want to run the track. But the operator has some ideas, but really the bailer has much better ideas about how to run it. But the challenge we've got is how do we trust that the, the bailer is the one really sending the signal and somebody's not packed into the system. So there's a system called ISOBUS that sets this requirement for connectivity between what we call implements controlling the main machine. And what ISOBUS put in for security, a bunch of people got together. It's why, you know, it's basically the old seed algorithm. So if I'm a, a baler supplier, I go to John Deere and I want to send controls to your tractor, they will give me an algorithm. And I put that algorithm in my controller, which generates a seed, a message. And every second, I have to send that message to John Deere, every second. And John Deere knows what it is because they gave you the seed and gave you the algorithm that you have to run in your control. But this ties up a lot of bandwidth. And I said this will work fine for the first few years, but at some point when you have thousands of models of tractors and 10,000 models of implements, who's going to be the key master to keep track of? I buy a new implement, or I buy an old implement, and if I want to run it with my tractor, how do I get that seed now into my new tractor to run with that old implement? So, so this huge issue, I think that's gloomy, it's going to, the science of security could help us. How can we have a failure drive tractor secure? What can we do as opposed to this old, I call it the NSA you know, 1960s algorithm, these seed algorithms that based on time you can't duplicate it, but of course not people can. But uh, this is the, the one that, that green layer is really a challenge. Because as we go up now, you know, there's this business loop, and then there's this outside loop. And as I said, with precision agriculture, if you read the New York Times in the last three months, or any magazine, the world's talking about agriculture. And the need for all the data that's being available now about plants, and genetics, and weather, and predicting the weather, all this information, there's companies now putting this together to give advice to, to farmers. What it will be, the farmers are very clear, I don't want the advice, just give it right to my machine. They, you send a report to the farmer, well, what's he going to do? Well, just tell the tractor what to do. He needs to steer this way, or till two inches deep instead of three inches deep. Don't tell me, do it automatically. That's where the value is going to be created in this position. So all those commands are going to come down to the system. And now, I mean, you do the same thing with autonomous cars whether it's driving a tractor or driving on Thomas car, it's going to come from this high-level system. But now how do you make sure things are secure if somebody's not hacked into the system? But the high-level systems don't involve some kind of external communication. Uh, uh, when you were describing um, some, some signaling back to John Deere, is that to some service that they're providing? Uh, or is that still on board the... the well, no, through, through the comm link, I can put on a tremble system, right? I can put anybody's implement on um, implements. So there's third, there are other people besides the tractor supplier that can put their system on there that talks to their back office. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, so, so is there is a service, I think, right? John Deere offers a service to the front. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It's a service. And so does some of that service provide the the uh, decision making or where the, the machine is going to travel. All of them do, yes, that's what they're trying to do. So, you know, like, there's a big thing is, uh, um, you heard this company, Climate Corporation, they're owned by Monsanto. And one of their big features is, you know, farmers today here in Illinois have 40 fields that are stretched out over 30 miles of space. One thing they will tell the farmers, this field's ready for harvest today, this one's ready for tomorrow, this one's gonna have this moisture, this one's gonna have that moisture, so this is how much drying you need, this is what your yield's gonna be, how many trucks you need, 
I mean, basically, that whole planning activity they create for me. So how much is it worth to your company to have this confidence that the bailer could drive the tractor in a trustworthy fashion? I think it's tremendous. That's what I've been pushing for. Is we need this, <laughs> but uh, most tractor companies, it's a nuisance to them. They don't... It's not worth it to them. It's, it's not worth it to the tractor people. It's worth it to the farmer. He's the customer. Yes. So that's why when the farmer asks for that feature, okay, two years ago. So to do this, do you, I mean, do you... Do anything like integrity checks on the firmware to be sure that the software has the stuff in there. That's one issue we have. So, you know, an interesting thing about a bailer, because we still haven't fixed this problem, but you know, a bailer, when it releases the bail, a round bail, the back door comes up. So, right now, the responsibility of safety in that system is the operator to know that their child's not standing behind that bailer, that the door comes up and does it. Well, now when the bailer does it, John Deere is wanting, okay, you validated and assured that there is safe to open that door. And the bailer is saying, well, I'm going to trust the operator. Can you validate that there's an operator sitting in the seat? And we found out we can't really validate there's an operator sitting in the seat. We have a seat switch. We have a seat belt. But it turns out farmers all the time put their toolbox on the seat, put the seat belt around it, and they're in the back of the tractor. They're in the back of the machine. <laughs> So you need a camera. But then they'll defeat that, right? So I mean, where, where do you, you guys build the system better than me about how you defeat these things? But you said you were worried about people hacking into it. Okay, yeah, I mean, the right. biggest thing, of course, is uh, once we went to engine controllers, and this is your car, or, I mean, everybody uses software to set the horsepower. So this is the biggest business fear John Deere has for security. We built interesting measures to prevent this, but still done on 25% of our machines, people get in and change the horsepower on their machines. Horsepower roughly sells for $1,000 per horsepower. So you had 10 more horsepower, you'd save yourself $10,000 to cost the machine. What are they giving up? Fuel economy. Just fuel economy. Yeah. And emissions. So, 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 so I, these involve, enough, I yeah. presume these involve firmware changes. You are, you get inside the code. That's right. Right. It's so, firmware or it's most a lot of it's, 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 people are so clever. They can change and then change and pull the sensor. Just change the calibration in your firmware of a sensor. And so now the sensor is feeding back into the controls. So there's all sorts of ideas we have about getting more horsepower. And the farmers are involved in. In this, or are they just kind of getting the, the ideas from the supplier? So, who's instrumenting this equipment? Are you the business instrumenting this equipment, or is a third party who help in instrumenting this equipment so it can be controlled based on the information? No, no, this is all our own equipment, but it's third party. Is a third party, because it's a bus, okay. they have access. You know, the stories of people, yeah. you know, because of the CAN bus. You can sit and look at these messages. There's nothing encrypted about these messages. And we debated this in John Deere when I first joined. They wanted to encrypt our bus. Well, our bus is running about 8% load already. If you put encryption on top of this with 13 controllers on that bus and waiting for encryption, you're, the cost, you're going to have to double the cost of your electronics. And then what do you put, 16-bit encryption? Well, how long does it take somebody to figure what that is? So we do a 32-bit? Can we go to 64 bit? I, mean, we, I showed them that it doesn't matter. If people want to get into our bus to change the horsepower. There's people that have time and energy to go do this. So. But the thing we have is as this opens up more and more, there should be more people looking for these ideas, not less. More people willing to steer the tractor. More people, especially going after horsepower. Horsepower is, you can come up with a little algorithm and sell it to a farmer and get a thousand dollars of horsepower for it. And sell it over and over and over. John Deere sells 150,000 tractor machines a year, 150,000 a year. All of them using uh, software to control the horsepower. So is, is the farmer is in the loop or no? I mean, is like the final, is he approving and validating the decisions or like the farmer? Yes. He is in the loop. <clears throat> Well, so again, somebody, except for the system where the bailer, what we call the implement drives the tractor. I see. 
this we're still struggling with because we will accept because of all the all the all the people before us who send out this message every second based on the algorithm that we gave them. And once we know it's their code, then we say, okay, whatever whatever signals you send to us, we'll accept. But Deer is and, and Case and so on are all concerned. Well, are they really making things safe? Um, right now, I'm assuming they're making but they worry about this. The implement people, as I said, are really worried. It's safe as long as there's an operator taking care of the heart. So this is going back and forth about uh, the adoption of this. And I think we're in the same mode as we're all talking about driving is. It'll all get accepted until there's an accident. Any stories of those? That... None yet, no. But once there's an accident, then it will be, OK, whose system failed here? Why wasn't there enough security? But it seems like if a guy puts his toolbox on the seat and fastens the seatbelt over it, he's accepted liability. Seems to be the case, yeah. But how do you ever discover this? <laughs> yeah, 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 it's kind of like taking your wheel, hands <laughs> off the wheel and reading the paper in your Tesla. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so we call it alert. So what I talk about is we need a sensor that sort of measures not alertness and competence. How competent are they to really run the implement? And how alert are they in general? So, and I feel like you could figure this out through the system. You don't need a sensor. How, how competent they are, it must be something about how they drove to, to the field or how, what they, the experience was before. Or, I mean, how do I build this sort of model around this operator? Once I, I know they're competent and they're alert, then I will allow a lot of controls to come in. If they're not competent or not alert, then, then I'll start blocking them. <laughs> well, alertness certainly changes. Competency making changes. So again, yeah, so this is the one idea we talked with the University of Illinois about. Was we did some funding here with the group about how to measure this. Haven't, haven't some of these things been faced in aircraft? In terms of uh, the pilots and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not personally aware of uh, anything, any research or anything in that area. But I know that we've done stuff uh, in our in our section on mode confusion. So it's not so much competency as making sure that the pilot is adequately engaged with what's really going on in the system as opposed to what he thinks is going on. So there's been a little bit of pilot modeling in that sense uh, to try to try to capture some of that information, but not so much in terms of competency. Not that we're aware of. Yeah, see, I, you know, the F-15 was the first plane that never had a red line. There's no such thing as a red line. You do whatever you want to the airplane. Well, the pilot can pull enough G's if you pass out. So in that plane in the 1980s, in the late 70s, they had to come up with this detection way. And so they did it basically by watching the pilot's eyes is to see if he's blacked out. But then the controls would take over and fly the flight. But so there's all there was this big argument with pilots. The pilots don't want to give up control. They're in a, they're in a dogfight, someplace. So they would need to pull the plane through things. So there's a big argument, and it still goes on, with when when can I sense the pilots passed out and I'll fly the plane? How do I make that transition? Two fighter jets come out, they have the same thing. So this is pilot alertness or pilot that they passed, passed out. We never had this problem before the F-15. The plane would break before the pilot passed out. But now fighter jets can pull enough maneuvers but anyway, you can see this, you know, on the top, I think you guys know this very well. And you're doing lots of work up there in the cloud and, and this wireless comm and these kinds of layers. There's places to put security in here because there is layers in the architecture. But what things to put in where and how and make them Universal and certainly this off-road and on-road <coughs> timing is rushed. <coughs> this architecture is just getting rolled out right now. In the next ten years, these things will be more set in stone. But the next ten years, there's a lot of opportunity to bring this in to these uh, low-level controls. And how do you just make it so it works across the industry? So, uh, to me, it seems like we know a lot of the ways to do those things, but in general, we haven't succeeded in getting people to adopt them. 
Uh, and so it's a, you know, and often that's an economic discussion, and that's why I asked the question about how much you're willing to pay for this. Because I think if you're willing to pay, I mean, the aircraft industry pays for it in a way. Uh, and that's, that's you know, it, it may not be a cutting edge research question for security, but rather, you know, adoption of techniques we know about. Yeah, so that, but that, this is where we need to understand that. So it's certainly going to be some value to this. So maybe research in the economics of some of that. <laughs> Well, be useful. I mean, you, you can argue that, that uh, we haven't solved the problem yet because the techniques we have are too expensive to adopt, and yeah. so they need to be. But, but that's not necessarily even entirely true, right? So, um, first of all, first of all, you do have there is an issue, so maybe a perception issue or a marketing issue, right? So you come to you know our executives and say, hey, we want to try to increase the security of this product, and they say, well, why? Right. What? How can we sell it for more money right. when we're done? Is that a feature? Not usually. People don't think of the security as a feature that way. If you can figure out how to market it, you know, maybe that would make sense. That's why I asked the, you know, do you have any horror stories yet of uh, accidents or outcomes that... Right. And so, unfortunately, security is almost always about protecting the denominator, right? It's about, it's about the cost uh, and the liability associated with, uh, with these activities. And so until you get a horror story, uh, sometimes it's hard to sell stuff. And that's really unfortunate, because that's not the position you want to be in. You want to be more proactive uh, in that kind of thing. So yeah, figuring out how to sell security. That, 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 should, that should be one of our new hard problems. New hard problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there's another approach. So, so does Caterpillar cooperate with John Deere at all? Yes, yeah, so with this ISO bus, it's brought the whole industry together. Because there's implement people and, and machines. Because it seems like none of you want your machines to be hacked. Okay, that that's true. that shouldn't be a competitive advantage. That should be a, a base right. foundation. Okay. Yes. So if you can all agree on that, that's right. And this ISO bus is the platform to start bringing those things in, as well as AutoZone. Pat Baller and John here are basically adopting on this AutoZone as their software platform. So if there's built-in ways to have security. Part of that package, people will adopt because they want that common. Like you said, the value that eighty percent of our code and our controllers we know it creates no value. It just has to, it just has to talk to that controller or talk to that actuator, read that sensor, just you know, debounce switches and things. That's twenty percent that really creates a feature. How fast it respond? How how precisely did this work? That's where we create value. Eighty percent. So this concept of security and not being able to reprogram controllers, yes, everybody needs this. It doesn't create any value. To this. So let's uh, thank the folks for coming here and sharing their views.